Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Ray with Sustainability Live. I'm here with Joe Thomas today. How are you doing? Doing well. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on to the show. You know, I wanted to say you've got an amazing background. I mean, I've seen some of your videos and you've, you've got in, in the, the background, you know, it's like you travel all over the world. So, you know, I'm thinking like when I first saw those, does he, does he live on an airplane? Does he have a home base? I mean, they were really compelling videos. And I know you've done a lot. I mean, you've been a mayor. You brought wind farms into communities. Just I'm happy to have you on the show to talk about sustainable business today. Give the users a little bit about your background and why you are where you are now. So uh, background is diverse. I worked for Stephen Covey for a number of years before his Seven Habits book hit the market. And he taught me the Seven Habits knee to knee. I mean, I sat in front of the guy and he taught me. And one of the things he really changed my life with was he taught me about content development. And this got me thinking, uh, and it, it, I, it hasn't stopped. It's, it's been a lifelong passion. Uh, but it was life-changing. That content was so good. And the application of that to sales, my first love in training has always been sales and communication. So that fit really well inside that seven habits form. And then the application of that is everywhere. Um, you know, you mentioned these these wind farms. Uh, Spanish Fork, Utah, has the second uh, uh, wind farm inside city limits in, in the entire U.S. It was the first west of the Mississippi. Hmm. Um, so it's it's um, it, it's unique, and it was a dead project when I went in as mayor. It had been rejected, and it came up, and basically through just simple negotiation, just just opening up communication. And people don't understand that communication, it really is about helping people understand what's in their best interest. It's not some Jedi mind trick. It's not some game or trick. And when people understand, hey, we can do this and it's, it's in our best interest, they tend to do it. Hmm. And all it took was communication, just putting the pieces block by block together. And next thing you know, everybody's on board. And a project that was dead in the water and rejected is now producing over 60% of this town's electricity. Wow. And the city and the schools in, in particular get funding from that uh, and will for the next 70 years. So would you say that the reason why we don't have more wind farms is just because they break down and they don't get past the finish line? Um, I, I would think that a lot of projects get killed, not because they're not good projects, because those that have the power to kill them don't understand that they're good projects. You know, this particular, you know, is, is wind the best thing to do? I, I can't tell you that. I think it's good. I live next to a canyon that the wind blows 18 hours a day. And so harnessing that is great. Uh, this particular wind farm happens to be down in the base of the canyon where there was a gravel pit. Hmm. And uh, so it, it's actually made it beautiful where it was an eyesore. Hmm. So this is a good one. This works for this community for sure. And it, nobody, nobody complains. I, I haven't. I don't think I've ever met anybody who didn't like them who lives here. Hmm. And uh, so, but those projects have to be negotiated in a way and communicated in a way that the buyers, the people who you know may oppose or could be the supporters, understand that. And when they understand that, that makes all the difference in the world. So big on communication. You know, I know we've talked a lot about sustainable business, and something that you focus on is focus. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I think it's extremely important that the users. Yeah, hear this. yeah this, this is probably one of the most beneficial things people can sink their teeth into and get a bang for the buck immediately. And the idea around focus is there's high focus and there's low focus. And the goal in communications, if you wish it to be persuasive and, and even beyond persuasive, if you just wish it to be effective, raising the focus of your communication can make a big, big difference. So let me give you an example of low focus. Low focus is self-referencing. And high focus is all about the other person. It's, it's not self-referencing. It's about the recipient. So uh, if, if I said, uh, Ben, I want to hire you as my sustainability coach. But I, I, I'd be honest with you. There's so many coaches that are seeking my business. I, I can't tell, tell you guys apart. You all look good to me. Why should I choose you, Ben? And what's the first thing that you'd want to say? Well, what I would like to say is because I've been there and I've done that, but I have a feeling from your question that that's not the right answer. So this self-reference is so tempting. You know, someone says, why should I buy from you? Why should I hire you? Tell me a little bit about your 
um, value proposition. And what comes out of it? The first word is usually we. Mm. Oh, we can help you. We've been there. We've done that. We, 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 we. It sound like the fifth little piggy. <laughs> and you got to stop that. So it's not about I've been there, I've done that. It's, well, you would benefit. Mm. You could tap into the experience of someone who's been there. So you replace all of the low focus, I, we, our, us, and replace with you, your. So it's all about them. Now, this seems simple and it's logical. It's just not easy. It takes practice to do this. So you're, you're saying the same thing just in a different way so that you feel it's about you and not about me, even though it is about me because yeah. of the question. Yeah, and there's, there's some interesting psychology that goes along with this. If I tell you all about me, though, look, I've been around the world and I've worked with some of the largest companies on earth and I, 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 me, 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 yada, yada, yada. Your brain has to hear all these things about me and then you have to make a, a, a leap. You have to take this information about me and you have to jump over to how it benefits you. Now, in the process of that jump, your brain could go a million places. If I say something like, well, I've, I've consulted with the big boys, your brain may connect that to a story of someone who said big boys once before, and you go, oh, this guy's full of it. I can't believe this guy because he sounds like the last guy who talked to me. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just open yourself up to all these possibilities that may or may not be helpful. You know, I'm thinking you right now, just direct, if you yeah. said I, I consulted with the big boys, I think like, well, I don't, I can never do that. I mean, how, how did he get into that network? I don't have the exactly. confidence. All these things that I build up these stories in my head. And I'm, then I'm not listening to you at yeah. all. So your, your brain is a pattern matching mechanism. And so you match a pattern and immediately you start listening to your own memory. And if you're listening to your memory, you're not listening to me. Hmm. And, and so I, let me, I'll deviate for just a second. Yeah. How many times has this happened? Someone approaches you and says, hi, my name is, and they stick their hand out to shake hands with you. And right there, your brain matches a pattern says, oh my gosh, this is an introduction. And at the end of this introduction, I'm expected to introduce myself. And then you go into your memory and you start rehearsing your own introduction. Mm -hmm. so you're practicing what you're going to say. I mean, what should I tell them about my family, my sports, my hobby, my career, my background, my education? What do I tell them about? And you do all this prep work. Well, while you're doing that, you're not paying attention to the person in front of you. And how many times has this happened? At the end of the introduction, you introduce yourself. And if someone put a gun to your head and said, what's their name? <laughs> yeah. you go, I'm going to have to take the bullet today because I don't remember their name. I, I just can't remember their name. And so it, a lot of times when that happens, I'm like, can you tell me your name again? I'm sorry. Or I would say to my friend here, hey, uh, introduce yourself because I forgot this person's name. Yeah. It, it happens all the time or scratch your name three times, whatever. That is. Are that way. So if we talk in yous and yours, listen, you would be able to access, you'd probably benefit from communicating with people who've been there. And if you tap into information that aligns with your experience, you can leverage that for your own good. You can learn from their mistakes. You can leverage their uh, successes. Now, I don't have to make that leap, but what does this mean? I know directly it means I, I win. Hmm. I have something good here. Hmm. And it, it just is such a difference. Um, the stories of this, like when I started to teach this, this, this theory was new and people were struggling and I would help them because I was new. It was, I'm trying to learn it myself. And we just kept seeing these, these successes that were almost unreal. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. I was in a, in a classroom and I, I, I maybe taught this class four times. And I was just still learning to teach it. And a guy raised his hand and he said, look, I've got an account that's been assigned to me. I've had it for eight months. I have yet to have anyone communicate to me from that account. The company told him, go get that account. And eight months, he goes, I've sent snail mail, email, voicemail. I've gone in person. I just can't break in there. I can't. No one will talk to me. So pull up your, your email, your most recent one. And we put it on the board. The entire class looked at it. And it was all about him. I think it had 17 self-references. Mm. 17. It's like, wow. In the email. So, yeah. So we rewrote this email and we made it all about the recipient. And it took about 25 minutes to do that. And I said, okay, yeah, how do you feel about this email now? He's like, yeah, it feels better. Anyway, we get a little further in the class. The guy's hand goes up. He says, I just got a reply. So I didn't know this, but he had sent the email from the class. 14 minutes later, he had a reply. 
Mm. He opened the reply up and not only did he have a response, he had an appointment. Guess I'd be happy to meet with you on Friday. Wow. And the, the guy, the whole room's standing there going, yeah, I can't believe this. Now, that seems like an incredible story, but when recipients receive this, this you and your language, they resonate with it because it's about them. And that's what it should be. Mm. Sales is about me making sales. Sales is really about enabling people to buy, educated, empowered, and with confidence. And that's what makes the difference. So raising that focus, it, it takes work, but man, does it pay off. By the way, that's happened hundreds of times now. Hmm. In, in live classes, people have sent emails and went, oh my gosh, I got a reply. So you're, so you're teaching people how to guide the conversation, really. Yes. And guide the, guide the communication so it isn't just reactive or what am I going to talk about? You are really steering it so that you win. You show people how to win through these kind of guiding. It's about helping the, the buyer, the recipient, understand it's in their best interest. I'll, I'll give you a non-sales related example. My daughter's a nurse. Um, she's been through this class three times. I took her around the world with me on a trip and I wouldn't let her be alone anywhere. So she had to sit through my class. But she knows the material and she studied it. I mean, we openly you know, work on it. As a nurse, she runs into patients that are reluctant to do what's in their best interest. For example, take some medication. Hmm. Um, and a, a patient recently uh, wouldn't take medication because it was going to make her vomit, you know, severely. Hmm. She didn't want to take it. She was fighting it. And they tried multiple times to get her to take this stuff. When my daughter comes on the shift, gets the story. They've been working, trying to get this lady for eight hours to take this stuff. And she walks in and says, look, I, I get where you're coming from. You don't want to take something that's going to make you, you know, vomit severely. But you also know that if you don't take it, what you face is X, Y, and Z. You're going to have nausea. You're going to face the falling over the next three days. And so you really have to choose. You know, it's the lesser of two evils, but either way, it's bad. And as they walk through this, you, you know, you've got some choices to make. The patient recognized either way, it's bad. And the lesser of the two is take the medication. I'll take the medication. That took about 30 minutes. Hmm. And the other nurses and staff were like, what did you do? Now she has multiple stories you know, patients who refuse to uh, take a shower and they're trying to force them. Well, people are, are human, they're individuals, so they, they resist that. Mm -hmm. My daughter doesn't try to force them. She just communicates with them and says, look at your world, look at from your perspective. If you do X, this happens. If you do Y, this happens. What, what would you choose? And when they choose, they tend to choose what's in their best interest. So great sales is helping buyers understand you know, that it's in their best interest. You, know, you guide that conversation. Uh, there's an old saying in sales says, you got to listen, you got to listen, you got to listen. Well, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Listening's a great thing, but you also need to guide because the buyer's not an expert. Mm -hmm. They're coming to you because you have expertise in an area. You guide the communication so they discover. They discover the dark side of their own moon, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that guided communication helps them recognize things they didn't recognize before that are not top of mind, that are not conscious. And it's just simple inquiry. And uh, it's, it, it's interesting because almost all this communication, when you, you watch it, and it's not just sales, but it certainly is sales. But beyond that, people ask questions of experts and experts go, boy, am I glad you ask? Let me give you the answer. And they just bombard them with answer. And what I coach people to do is don't just answer, but inquire. We call this A2I2. A2I2. Answer appropriately, inquire immediately. Boom. boom. Hmm. So someone says, you know, why should I hire you? So, well, look, you'd, you'd hire me if you knew the return would exceed the investment. If you could get the value you're after. And you notice that high focus. Mm -hmm. And then the question really is, how do you measure value? So there's a short answer and immediate inquiry. And so you answer and inquire, answer and inquire. Hmm. And the inquiry is what allows you to guide. If you just answer, they're going to ask you the next question. Then they're going to ask you 20 questions. Right. So how long have you been doing this? What's your experience? What's your price? What kind of discounts can you give me? And if you go down the list and answer every one of them, at the end of that, they will say, thank you. Run along. Hmm. Next. Right, because they had a list that they asked 10 other people. Yeah, and when, and when they get through with it, you all sound alike. They can't differentiate, so they go, well, I want the low price leader, which probably is not in their best interest. Right. 
And so the goal is to guide the communication so people can discover there's more more value there. And it's just that exposure. When people recognize that something different's in their best interest, they do something different. And if not, they'll just, they'll discover with greater confidence what they already thought was right. So, you know, it's. You said, you said something a minute ago about the dark side of the moon. You've got a diagram. Could you explain that a little bit more? Cause that's a pretty cool concept. And I like that well, visual that you showed me. In, in classes, I give people cards. This is the, the CEO card and CEO stands for clarify, explore an outcome. Those are three types of inquiry. Hmm. Um, Clarify, if somebody says, you know, I'm really looking for a dynamic portfolio. You know, what does dynamic mean? And so you would ask them, define dynamic. And that's clarify. That clarifies the very word that they say. What it does is it moves them from this uh, dark side of the moon, what they say, Mm -hmm. and it helps them move to what they mean. Much more detail. Okay. And the goal is if you guide the communication, you begin to explore more of their moon. And so the surface of the moon is one thing. And that, that's why you guide it so they begin to think differently. As an expert, you can help them see their own world in a different way. Ultimately, is to get to motive. The motive's under the surface. Hmm. That core value. That comes through outcome inquiries. Outcome inquiries are the least utilized and probably by far the most valuable. And so, for example, if someone were asking, let, let's just take this generic sustainability topic. So I'm looking to hire you, uh, Ben, as my consultant in sustainability to make my business sustainable. And we're talking about that. Uh, one of the inquiries that would be powerful is, and I'll reverse this now, I'm the sustainability coach. I would say, Ben, what's the ultimately would you like as an outcome of sustainability? Like, I know you want the business to thrive, but for what reason? Hmm. And, and you have to stop and think about that. So look, if your business is going to thrive, it might be, that you want to pass this on to your children. It might be that you want to set up an organization that could thrive, you know, without you or, or your family, you know, into the future and benefit others. It might be that you want wealth and, and, uh, you know, successful and some money. So if you had the money, what would you do with it? That's an outcome inquiry. What's the outcome of having the money? And what's interesting about this is, as you guide this conversation, people begin to expose their own motives to themselves. Now you're along for the ride, so you get to understand these motives as well. But I'm always uh, humbled by this to watch people discover there's really some interesting and powerful motives that are kind of neglected. And it gets down to most people are driven by some very great core values. And so it isn't what they say, it isn't what they mean. It's really what do they want the outcome to be which they may yeah. not even know themselves. They may just say, I right. want money or yeah. legacy, create legacy, whatever that is. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about exposing these motives, motive is the self-evident root of motivation. So as the motives appear, motivation skyrockets. Hmm. And, and so it's helping them get crystal clear on their own motives and it simultaneously produces motivation to do it. Hmm. So, you know, money, yeah, everybody wants more money, but for what reason? And if you start to think about the more reasons, um, I asked a guy recently on a, a webinar, I said, you know, t- tell me something that you uh, uh, want for Christmas. And, you know, this was just in the last 10 days. And he said, well, I've, I, my gift to myself this year, and he threw it out, was a new snowboard. And I said, and do you know why you're getting the new snowboard? He goes, yeah, because I love to snowboard. And this new board is the, you know, the coolest, slickest, fastest, you know, blah, blah, blah. I says, is that it? And he goes, yeah. I said, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you. I will bet you there are substantially more motives than that. Hmm. And then this is where you guide the communication. And, and one simple guiding area, there's, there's eight primary motives. If you guide people into these motives and ask, often they're there. So I turned to him and I said, now you didn't mention um, anything about snowboarding with anybody. Do you snowboard alone or do you go with someone? He goes, oh, no, I snowboard there as much as I can with my dad. He's a, bit, he's a bit older, but we go as much as we can. I said, does that new, new snowboard, would that contribute to the quality of time with your dad? Mm. And he's like, you could see his eyes broke contact. So now, you know, he's in this, um, it's a drop in mental fluency. And this is him exploring his own world. He's starting to uncover his own motives. Yeah. Yeah. I said, well, let me ask you, 
if your dad had a new snowboard, would the quality time together be better? And you can see his eyes broke contact again. Uh -huh. See, he's now exploring his world. Huh. And he came back and said, yeah, this is a big deal because I, I don't have that many more seasons with my dad because of his, his health. See, this is motive. And now he's considering maybe he needs to get two snowboards. Um, and, and then you go, so if you did that, if you had that new snowboard and your dad had that new snowboard, what difference would that make in the long run? This is an outcome inquiry. What difference would it make in the long run? And he's just totally motivated by upping the quality of time with his dad. Now, he doesn't have to have a new snowboard to do that. Mm. The fact that he gets crystal clear on his own motives, that's the power of communication. And a guided conversation, when guided by a, a specialist, helps the generalist really get the most out of it. Mm. So you want your business sustainable? You want your growth? Help the other person. Forget about growing your business. Focus on those that receive the goods or services of that business and watch what happens. Your business grows, right? The, um, you know, I'd like to uh, ask you to give some practical advice for around this email um, thing, because I think it's really important that people take away from this. What exactly can I do? I understand all this kind of, but what can I do today that would help me uh, with my business? Great, great question. Ben, if you look at emails that you send out, and especially those that, you know, intend to persuade, First and foremost, check the focus. How many times do you reference yourself in that email? Mark every single one of them and try and eliminate them. It'd be the first thing I'd tell you. Many people send out an email, uh, like here's a generic example. Um, Hi, Ben, my name's Joe Thomas. We haven't met before. Let me introduce myself. I work with Impact Advantage and we specialize in helping. This is a really bad email. That whole first paragraph is all about me. Right. Yeah. And how many times do you get that email and you don't read it, you just delete it? Yeah. So raise the focus. You know, the rule of a great email is dessert first. What's the outcome for them first? Get that in there. Ben, as a sustainability professional, you may benefit from, Ben, you may find an opportunity to apply the following hmm. in your business. You may find it interesting about, so something about you and the stuff about me, if, if any, will be the very end. Mm. So raise that focus. Um, you know, I, I coach people around emails. I send them a card. This is on how to write an email. Mm. And there, there's four areas. Uh, raise the focus first and foremost. The next thing, this, this will be a simple introduction, but use boosts, incredible voices. A boost is a, something we inject into communication to elevate it. So like a compliment or agreement or understanding, uh, anything that's around the, the recipient. So that elevates the communication, makes it a little better. A credible voice is instead of me telling you that, you know, I have experience, you would use the voice of a peer. Those that have used this service have found it to be helpful. Mm, okay. That makes sense. And so yeah. you convert stuff that you want to say out of your mouth, you convert it into a more credible voice, which could be a peer to the recipient or a friend of the recipient or a, a news source to the recipient that they would deem as credible. So it's and, almost like a third-party validation. Yeah, yes, and, and there are hundreds of these examples. And then, you know, the last thing is always end the email with a simple call to action. You know, an invitation for them to do something. You know, to respond, to read more, and make it easy on them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's shocking. We, we sent out uh, a group that I worked with, large uh, software company. Everyone knows them, Global. And they had in the particular area, it was actually in the Chicago area, they were sending about 2,000 emails per month. Um, and we took those emails and rewrote them all, just using a simple guide, just raised the focus. The first email that went out produced 13 times the appointments of their previous emails. Now, the previous email series they've been doing for years. Hmm. And then the first change, 13 times the appointments, their sales went through the uh, roof. Wow. Uh, they, they did not have enough people to handle the sales. Now, you know, that's exceptionally high, but it told you that that market was so hungry for a message that was about the recipient. And it, it, this is a surprising part of this story, but somewhere around six to eight weeks after this email series went out, I got a call from the sales leader and he said, hey, I want to read this to you. And it was a it was a rejection letter. It was a response to the email, said, thanks, but no thanks. 
but it was very nice in the way it said it. And I said, well, okay, you got rejected very nicely. He goes, Joe, we never get rejected nicely. <laughs> I mean, most people just say, you know, uh, F off or get me off your spam list. Stop emailing me. They're always attacked. He said, we have close to 400 nice rejections. Wow. We've never had that. And some of them are saying, tell me a little more and I'll refer you to the right person. Mm -hmm. And that's so shocking. Yeah. But, you know, if you just look at your email and you can even look at just communication just today, how many times do you talk about yourself? Think about it. Can I raise that? You know, um, your spouse says, uh, you know, where do you want to go to dinner? Uh, well, it's COVID. We're not going to dinner, hon. Uh, <laughs> so just think, how many times do you reference yourself? Can you change it just a little inside communication? Uh, make it more about the recipient. And the, the opportunity, in my opinion, of this is endless. And the more I work at it, the better I feel. And I, I notice those around me respond better. It's, it's, a, it's a battle because my own ego wants to talk about me. Right. And I can constantly fight that and just smush it down a little bit and make the world a little bit more about them. And, and it's it's amazing what happens. Well, it, it's, a, it's a default. It's easy when someone says, hey, tell me all about you. You want you just want to talk about you. Yeah. But that isn't really what they mean, I don't think. You know, no. You're saying. No. Um, you know, someone walks in your office and, you know, assuming you've got a uh, a fish hanging on the wall. Oh, did you catch that fish? And you're tempted to go, oh, let me tell you, you know, it was, it was mist on the water and I cast the fly. Maybe more likely they're fishermen themselves. And you'd say, you know, I did catch it. Are you a fisherman? Mm. That's what you try to. That's it. And, yeah. and they go, yes, I love to fish. Oh my gosh. My grandfather took me fishing. Every time I see a fish and, and now their story comes out because that's what they wanted to talk about. Now there's nothing wrong with you telling the story about you catching the fish. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But the people that bring it up, bring it up for a reason. And most often it ties back to them. And if you're mindful of that and you give them the space to talk and you guide that, you can help them discover ways to help themselves. And oftentimes it involves you. So for a sales perspective, it's very helpful. Hmm. Um, just a communications perspective. You know, my daughter as a nurse using these tools, I, I just tell you, it's just great satisfaction watching her help people make decisions for their own health. You know, where typically the nurse is, I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. you just let that go. I am here to help you, but you are the first thing. Let's start with you helping you. And her job becomes easier. And people get happier. Helping them make their own decisions and feeling like it is their own decision. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's powerful. It's great. Good. Well, what other tips do you have that someone could take directly from today that you would like to, to have here in the next couple of minutes? Yeah, there, there, there's plenty of content right there. So just work on it. Be mindful of it. You know, look around at the advertisement that you hear. 95% of it is low focus. You know, we make the best. We're, we, we, we. See if you can convert it in your head just for practice, but work on your own languaging and see what happens. I'm going to try it today, although I just talked about myself right there. So, <laughs> so I need to be mindful about it. That's, uh, that is the, the key. So thank you for your time today. How can people get a hold of you? What's the best way? Website, email, direct message? The website, impactadvantage.com. Um, Joe Thomas, my, my email is joe.thomas at impactadvantage.com. What, uh, what are you going to be working on this year that's different from 2020, I mean, in the upcoming year? The big difference this year is much more digital because uh, I, I haven't seen an airport since March. And I'm a guy that's flown hundreds of thousands of miles a year. And so almost uh, uh, everything I've been doing now has been digital, you know, webinars and uh, uh, canned, you know, the uh, presentation on video. So I'm working on more of that, trying to figure out how to make that more effective. So people that participate with it get a bigger bang for their buck. And that's uh, new learning. Well, that's a great value for me today. I've got a lot of, of uh, thinking to do about how I, how I talk about things, you know, even around the house here. So I appreciate your time. Appreciate oh, you being around. Yeah, this is this is fun. All right. Thanks. Well, we'll talk to you soon. All right. All right.